complimenting you on this uh, on this literary festival uh, and uh, what I want to do is given the limit uh, given the time limit uh, just plunge directly into my talk um, you already know the title why liberal democracy is necessary for Indian development and uh, let me uh, confess that I'm not a political scientist and uh, you know some of my critics say I'm not an economist either, uh, but I, I have the benefit of uh, seeing political economy play out in policy making in India and across the world, uh, including when I was the chief economist of the IMF. And uh, I want to uh, say that there is a um, an argument that is often made that uh, democracy holds back growth and development, and that India needs strong even authoritarian leadership with very few checks and balances on it uh, for sustained growth. And indeed, India seems to be drifting in this direction. I think this argument is uh, totally misguided and wrong uh, because it's based on an outdated model of development and it's totally unsuited to the Indian environment. I think the, our development has to build on unique aspects specifically our liberal democracy and its institutions. And I believe if we can do that, our future as a, as a country is limitless. However, if we allow our liberal democracy to crumble into majoritarianism or authoritarianism, it's not just our economic future that would be jeopardized, but our soul as a nation and our place in the community of nations. Let me elaborate on these arguments and uh, in the next few minutes. Every time India uh, goes down, we get overly pessimistic. Every time India rebounds, we think uh, we're on top of the world. And, and we are in the second phase, uh, at least uh, at present, with strong growth numbers through uh, even though the consequences of the war in Ukraine uh, rising inflation, rising interest rates, and of course the stock market uh, sort of uh, problems are casting not just a shadow on India, but on the rest of the world. Now, I think any growth should be, should be celebrated, uh, and it is good that India is uh, the fastest growing uh, large economy in the world this year, but we cannot ignore the fact that the rebound is from disastrous numbers posted last fiscal year, and that does uh, uh, put the growth this year in perspective. Our poorest citizens, especially their children, have suffered the most during the pandemic and continue to suffer with what at best is a K-shaped recovery. The scarring of our lower middle class households and MSMEs will mean that domestic demand will remain subdued after the initial rebound. And we're seeing some of that. Uh, furthermore, even with strong growth, we are still significantly below where we were going uh, pre-pandemic. JP Morgan estimates the real GDP today is about 6 to 7 percent below the pre-pandemic trend line, something which, you know, in the West, many countries have caught up to the pre-pandemic trend, trend line. Now, our slow growth is not all the fault of the pandemic, not all the fault of the war. Uh, our underperformance predates the pandemic. It's, it's uh, a fact that we've been underperforming our potential for over a decade, uh, probably since the onset of the global financial crisis. And the key measure of this underperformance is our inability to create the good jobs that people like you need. Uh, many of you have read or experienced the fact that 12 million applicants uh, were there for 35,000 railway jobs. Uh, many of you, uh, while away, uh, you know, time sitting for exams for government jobs. And unfortunately, some people continue doing that until they become too old to sit because they're not successful. Uh, why should we have so few good government jobs? Uh, and why does it have to be government? Why can't the private sector create many more jobs? Most worrisome is that we have a scarcity of jobs even when so many of our women are not working outside the house. Uh, in India, the female labor force participation is amongst the lowest in the G20. Uh, this was in 2019 at 20.3% and matters have actually declined since then. 
Now, this labor force participation is about as low as Saudi Arabia. But even Saudi Arabia has reformed and its female labor force participation is over 33% today. So our women are simply not participating in the labor force. Think how much richer we would be as a country and how much less frustrated our youth would be if there were good jobs for all. There is a real question about where we have uh, not done right. Before I go further, I should note that we have many successes. So let me not just focus on the failures. Uh, our recent win in the Thomas Cup uh, is, is one such success. Uh, it's come after many years. It is uh, uh, an, a, a, an event to celebrate. But in the two decades after the 1991 reforms, we actually had 7% average growth, something very few large countries have achieved. It is something to be proud of. And even over the last decade of relatively slow growth, India has had some major successes, including, for example, the fact that we are the largest two-wheeler manufacturer in the world, exporting classic Enfields to the land of the Harley-Davidson, that is America. Um, in the financial sector, the other stack and its applications like UPI or the Universal Payments Interface are digitizing your lives. Uh, many of you must have used the UPI uh, in order to make transactions. We have over 4 billion transactions a month now on UPI. Uh, we started UPI in 2016 when I was at the RBI. Just to put this in perspective, the equivalent Fed now, which allows direct retail payments uh, in America, will be started by the Federal Reserve only in 2023, seven years after we did UPI. Uh, indeed, my colleague, uh, my RBI colleague, uh, Padmanabhan, tells me that the idea for UPI was hashed at the RBI. Uh, I will take his word for it. And uh, NPCI then developed the idea superbly. Uh, UPI is now studied across the world by central banks intending to implement fast retail payments. So the point here is that uh, we can actually uh, do, um, you know, uh, you know, come up to the best of, in the world, uh, especially our youth who know no, uh, no limits. Uh, and I experienced this uh, at the RBI. Our young uh, workers in the RBI just were, were ready to come up to any challenge that was posed to them. So given that we have the capabilities, uh, it's not the fault of our people that we're not doing so well. I would argue it's the fault of uh, our leadership and a failure of imagination of our politics. Uh, to see what's going wrong, let's think about what went right in the early decades since liber liberalization in 1991. Typically, it was well thought through frameworks or infrastructure that freed our people to utilize their creativity and enterprise. I mean, think about Prime Minister Vajpayee's golden quadrilateral highway. Uh, that building project opened up and connected India and on top of that, when we had the rural road projects of subsequent governments, they connected those, those highways to the interior of India. And when the interior is connected, it does wonders for development. Uh, think about when a village is connected to the rest of India. Overnight, you see that the farmers can sell uh, vegetables, dairy and poultry uh, to the markets and so you because the uh, milk eggs and chicken and vegetables can be transported to the markets so uh, as a result incomes go up uh, because incomes go up people can spend because they can spend shops start opening and they start stocking the latest goods within the uh, the village you can go on and on but development starts occurring because the village has been connected up this is an example about creating a framework, in this case, physical infrastructure to connect up the country, and that makes a change. The emphasis on hard infrastructure uh, during the process of reforms was also supported by efforts to improve schooling. Indian schooling went up tremendously in the first two or three decades after reform, and, and the skilling of our workforce and the steady liberalization of tariffs and regulations made our economy more competitive by forcing our firms to become so. And when they were forced, they rose to the challenge and became really cost effective. So as a result, uh, our economy improved tremendously, but also in the process, our citizens' control over the government 
was strengthened by acts like the UPA's Right to Information Act and our ability to do more ourselves was improved by, for example, uh, digital developments like the Aadhaar's TAC. Now, all this led to 7% growth. Uh, but the question we have to ask is, you know, with the fall off in growth over the last decade, are we doing the right thing? Do we need to go in an entirely new direction or focus on deepening or broadening the past reforms? So at this point, it's worth asking, what exactly is the government's vision today? And it seems to center around the term Atma Nirbhar or self-reliance. In some ways, this is a continuation of what we used to do in the past. Uh, in its last budget, the government emphasized better connectivity and logistics and devotes uh, some resources to it. That is good. Yet in some ways, the model behind Atma Nirbhar seems to be a reversion to a more distant and failed past, where we focused on physical capital and goods, not human capital and services, on protection and subsidies, not on liberalization and competition. Now, this has real effects. For example, uh, there's a tragedy that is overtaking our school children, especially the poor ones who have not been able to go to school during the pandemic. Because they've been out of school for two years, they've not just lost the two years that they haven't studied, but they've forgotten what they knew before, and so are many years behind. There are very few extra resources being devoted today to rescuing this potentially lost generation of ch children. And I think this is a serious omission. Now, perhaps the central government thinks the state governments will take care because uh, schooling is a state subject. And indeed, Tamil Nadu has come up with an innovative scheme, Ilam Tedi Kalvi, to hire 1.75 lakh local workers to offer children a remedial learning and to draw them back to school. Alarmingly, uh, the Tamil Nadu uh, Education Department has discovered that over 5 lakh children have dropped out, and these now have to be coaxed back to school. Now, I don't believe Tamil Nadu is the worst affected state, but many worse affected states are not doing very much. But let us try and understand what is the idea behind PLI or production linked subsidies. Now, to put this in perspective, you have to know that there is one country which has done even better than India in growth, and that is China. We're always compared with China because in 1995, China and India were neck to neck in per capita GDP in uh, uh, purchasing power parity dollars, China was about 1,800, India was about 1,600. The numbers today are staggeringly different. China's per capita GDP is 17,200 and India 6,390. They've grown to almost three times our size, even at purchasing power parity at market exchange rates, they're about five times our size. Now, Obviously, we are countries of about similar size in population, so it is natural to think that perhaps we should look at China carefully and try and replicate their success in manufacturing exports. And certainly if the government wants to do this, this is no small vision. But the question we have to ask is, is China's path even feasible for India given its circumstances? Think about how China achieved its growth. It achieved it by suppressing wages and consumption and limiting the returns on deposits to households by reducing the interest rate paid to them. Why did they do this? Because this then allowed firms uh, to make more profits uh, because you're paying lower than market wages, because you're paying lower than market interest rates, you make more profits. And that allowed Chinese firms to compensate for some of the initial deficiencies in China, allowed them to grow. And over time, China created a more decent, uh, a more educated workforce and more decent infrastructure and reduced tariffs. And uh, essentially, uh, because of those initial effective subsidies, the fir firms grew fast and China grew fast and eventually uh, sort of uh, reached world, world levels of infrastructure and many of its population has become much better educated. We're trying to replicate that perhaps. But our starting point is different. Uh, it is impossible.